So this is a talk about system identification. That's something that we do uh, in many different areas of science, of course. And in this particular case, what we're interested in is interfaces for prosthetics and reconstruction of, uh, of larger neural systems. So of, say, say, take a piece of neural tissue and you want to reconstruct what's going on in there. And um, why is this an issue that's important for us as well? Because you need to build special tools to make that possible and you run into specific problems in system identification then. So this is kind of just a sort of little four, uh, four quadrants overview of why is this an interesting problem. Uh, why would you care about this talk at all? I'm going to go through this in a number of different steps. The first one is just to talk about representations and models in general. So where does system identification come in at all? What does that mean? Um, then mental processes and neural circuitry. So how do you apply this when we're talking about what's going on up here and neurons? Uh, what do you have to do to make this a tractable problem? So simplification. And then the part that I'm most interested in really is the difficulties. There are a whole slew of them because this is a gigantic problem. And uh, I, my main reason for giving the talk is kind of to see if people are getting ideas and then, you know, maybe someone will help me with all these difficulties. Uh, so, yeah, um, modern science really rests on the principle that we're trying to understand things by representing them or by discussing them, by describing what's going on and building models. Um, building a model means that we have to come up with some kind of a simplified representation. Uh, let's assume, first of all, that in nature you can define various different parts of nature. So I've got here, you know, I've got molecules, for example. They're little pieces of the environment, but they're not independent. They exist next to all kinds of other little pieces, and they affect one another in some way. So whenever something happens to one of those parts, then other parts start to react in some way, and you need to try to describe what that is. How do you describe that? Well, we say that there are some kind of information passing between them. They're communicating with one another. So we can describe those as signals. Now, there are, in nature, a lot of little pieces. This is just an example up there of <coughs> molecules in a gas. And so if we're trying to describe a system, if we want to understand something about it, then first of all, we need to have some kind of idea of what part of that system, what part of its behavior is interesting to us. We're not trying to describe everything all at once. That's usually much too difficult. Everything is an iterative process. So we try to keep it simple. This is why, and there's that little uh, chicken over here, physicists like to work with spherical chickens in a vacuum because they like to simplify their problems. Um, that's the same thing that you have to do all throughout science everywhere where you're building a model, you're representing something. Um, and you want to look only at the interesting effects, the effects that you're actually talking about. Uh, so um, I think I'm going to jump ahead just slightly because I had this example further on. If you're trying to describe, for example, how a, a, a chip works, you've got a microchip, you know it does something, but you don't know what it does. So you want to reverse engineer what's going on. And this is part of a laptop computer, for example. You don't want to describe how it is heating up the table as it's operating. You don't want to understand how um, cosmic radiation is affecting the bits in there, even though they may once in a while flip a bit or something like that. That's not really the relevant part if you're trying to understand what's going on. You know that the signals you're interested in in that case are the voltages that are going in. They're causing these bits 1, 0, and the output as well. So this is your input and your output. Those are the signals you're interested in. And the same way, when you have other problems, you also need to understand what are the signals you're interested in. And they're directly related to the behavior or the effect that you're trying to observe. So we're trying to constrain the model. Uh, OK, let me see which one I press here. Okay. <clears throat> so once we have some idea of what our signals of our interests are, then we can talk about how do they communicate. What are these signals? Um, in physics, really, there are only four types. Uh, of interactions. We've got gravity, electromagnetism, and the strong and weak nuclear interactions, or nuclear force. Now that seems like a very simple set. You've just got four that you have to look at, but those, those are much too complicated, of course, so we never talk about those. Instead, you pick something smaller, something like, okay, we only want to talk about uh, the currents that are passing from one neuron to another, or we want to talk about how temperature affects a neuron, or we want to talk about how pressure affects it, or are neurons sensitive to sound waves? which, by the way, they are. So there are all kinds of things that are affecting these cells, 
Some of them we want to describe when we're making a model, depending on what the purpose is, what is this effect we're looking for. Uh, so we try to line up a sort of a prioritize what we're going to start describing, because we want to start with a simple model first, and then get into something more complicated. This is all still very general. Well, I see that there's a little mishap over here, but uh, it's not very relevant. Once you have your system identification problem, so once you have a problem where you know <clears throat> what system you're looking at, what the effects are that you want to describe, and what the signals are that are of interest, then you can look at this as a system identification problem, like you would have one in, in control theory, for example. So you've got yourself something that you consider a black box. It's called a black box if all you can do is observe. So you, you don't have the ability to manipulate it and give it the inputs that you like and then look at the output, you're just observing. You call it a gray box if you can also stimulate and observe. So you've got both those tools to your disposal. And what you do then, having some notion that there is a state in there, that it receives input and output, is you try to find something called the transfer function. And there are a number of ways you can do that. Um, one of the examples of a formal method is the Volterra series expansion. Basically, this is just a bunch of kernels that you multiply with the input and with the output, and you, sorry, with the input to describe the output. And this particular expansion here allows you to take into account all of the previous history of what's been going on. So you've got a history of the system, and uh, when you try to make it simple, of course, you make many of those kernels zero. But this is just one very general example of how you can do how you can describe a system identification. You can describe the problem in a way where you can identify parameters, these kernels, that will then describe your system. Usually something like a Volterra series expansion is a bit too general, a bit too complex for the problem that you're looking at. Um, although I do know some people who use it even in neural circuit uh, um, identification or neural circuit descriptions. And one of them is Ted Berger that we'll get to in a little moment. So the next part we're going on to now is um, when we take all of this general stuff that I just described about what does it mean to make models, what does it mean to represent things and then to do a system identification, what are the specific problems you run into or how do you do this when you're working with mental processes and neural circuitry? Uh, notice the word that I'm using, mental processes, is not the same thing as saying a neural circuit function or something like that. And the reason is because there are some very specific things that we, or at least I, and many neuroscientists are interested in, and those are really the functions of what's going on inside our mind. It's a very abstract term. It's not the same thing as just saying, let's look at the, uh, you know, at the neurons and the synapses and what's going on there. We want to find that connection between what is going on up here and what's going on in those systems. Now, when you look at this, um, well, one thing you can say is, well, here's an MRI, it looks at some bit of language work that's been going on. You can tell that there are a number of different regions that light up when you're carrying out a word task. And uh, many neurons are involved, so this involves large ensembles of neurons. And the types of effects that we're looking at in this case, the sort of things that we're interested in, our problems, are things such as perception, learning, decision-making, emotional responses, consciousness, or self-awareness, language, motor, so motor control, all the things that we consider uh, part of well, what goes on in a living organism, what goes on in us, uh, in the brain. And some of those are observable. So some of these you would call the kinds of behaviors that, say, a behaviorist would try to describe, because for a behaviorist, only observable things exist. All the internal things do not really exist. They're not part of the problem space. And some of them are internal. And I'm not a behaviorist. I'm very interested in the internal states. I'm interested in um, emotional states. I'm interested in learning and memory, all of that stuff. So that's part of what we're trying to describe and look at here. Um, now, this, this is kind of a tiny little tangent because we just jumped into doing system identification, doing uh, a description of neural circuitry. And I said this connects somehow to how we think, so to mental processes. And um, then one of the questions that comes up is, why would you want to do this by describing the neural circuitry? 
why aren't you just trying to describe in general terms the kind of functions that are being carried out so that you have a more abstract overview of what's happening. And if you work in artificial intelligence, for instance, this is a very generic mode that to take, is to say, let's make an abstraction of the function that's supposed to be carried out and work with that instead of looking at the implementation in neural circuitry. That's one question, and my answer to that usually is, well, if you're really looking at what's going on inside a person, and it's not so much that you're interested in building, say, a, a device for um, object recognition or so. What's happening here? That's interesting. Huh. Oh, well. <laughs> I'll just keep going. Yeah, just keep going. Uh, so, so if you're not just interested in, in, um, in how to recognize cars, for example, which would be one function that you could program an AI to do, um, but you're interested in understanding how we see cars, you want to understand that, then you're more interested in the underlying circuitry. You need to know how are these things interacting? What happens if I'm trying to recognize a car, but that circuit is being used for something else right now? Why am I now, now not able to see the car coming even though it's right in front of me or something like that? All these strange effects that happen. So this is very specific to, yeah. So what I was trying to talk about were all the different aspects of how it matters whether you're abstracting or trying to reconstruct faithfully. And the first point that I addressed was, well, what if you're just trying to look at a certain task or function, and then you could be very abstract about it, or if you wanted to understand how that task is being carried out inside a person, inside a human, then you want to be more detailed about it. But there are other reasons to be, um, to be reconstructing rather than being abstract. Um, one of them is if you're interested in creating neuroprosthetics, for example, you want to create something that you can use to repair function, to restore function, or if you're interested in making interfaces, in that case, you need to be interfa interfacing with the way that things are being carried out inside the brain, not in some other abstract system. Um, and finally, if you're interested in, for example, uh, how memories are stored in the brain and you want to be able to identify a memory or some kind of a, a representation of something that's been learned, you need to be able to extract that from that circuitry itself and demonstrate that you know how to do this. Then you've got, then you've grounded your theory, then you know exactly why and how this memory has been stored. Um, that's not the same thing as coming up with a very abstract model. And I would call even this, this is a, a one slide showing some of the connectivity in the Blue Brain project and the Blue Brain, sorry, um, uh, cortical model that Henry Markram has built in Lausanne. It's a wonderful, beautiful model. It, it has incredible detail. It is a so-called compartmental model, so it has a very, uh, a very fine-grained detail of the morphology of the neurons in there. It's using, using Hodgkin-Huxley equations, so it's got a good model of the synaptic receptor channels and all of that stuff in there. Um, the cells, all the data, the statistics come from many studies they've done on a lot of different rats, and well, that's it, exactly. They've done these studies on a lot of different rats, so what you have here is a stochastic uh, representation of what a column might look like, but none of the connections in there intrinsically mean anything. And on top of that, the system has so many parameters when you look at it. It's what you might call over-parameterized for most of the types of tasks that they carry out with it or that they test on it. So when you want to train it to, to say, just propagate away from one side of the column to the other, you want to train it to carry out a certain <coughs> oscillation or to store something, sure. You can do it, but it's not a guarantee that that is the way that it really works in the system because there are so many different ways to get the same function into something with so many parameters. So that's an issue with these kinds of models. Not that they're bad, they're great models, it's just it's different from the kind of model that I'm talking about. So those are a few of the points about that, but we can get back to that if you have questions about it. And I think those questions are important because they're the questions that are kind of at the foundation of why you even do something like this. And they are the questions that relate directly to your own background and the goals that you have. So it's often something that comes up. <clears throat> okay, so I already kind of preempted uh, part of this slide when I was talking about the example of a chip and how would you carry out system identification in a chip. The signals of interest in that case are these bits or voltage states that you have and not just randomly everything else that's going on in those chips. The same way we can say, well, if we're looking at a neural circuit, what sort of signals are most interesting to us? Now, 
there is still a lot of debate about exactly what influences the function that's going on in these neural circuits. But what we do know is that spikes are incredibly important. So these action potentials, and by a spike, this kind of already simplifies the idea of an action potential. An action potential is really something, an electrical current with a shape that it goes up, it goes down, it has a certain after hyperpolarization, things like that. But the really relevant point is when it happens, the timing of an action potential. That's why we call it a spike. When does a spike happen? Spikes are the way that our sensory system transmits information to the brain. So when you hear something, for example, your cochlea turns this into spikes, into a train of spikes, where the spikes occur at certain intervals. When you drive your muscles, so for example, the fact that I'm able to communicate with you right now, I'm speaking, I'm driving my vocal cords, that's all carried out by spikes that are arriving at a certain rate and certain intervals. And, of course, for heavy and learning, this whole concept of neurons that fire together, wire together, well, actually, it's not just whether they fire together, it's what is the time in between they're firing. Synapses store information based on the difference in time of a presynaptic and postsynaptic spike. So again, the spike timing is essential. <clears throat> Oops. More mishaps. Um, yeah, so not sure if this is the best moment to mention nothing, but here we go. That's back on. Um, so one way to describe the problem of system identification in neural circuitry is to say that we want to be able to predict spike timing very accurately. And there are some examples of work in this area and using system identification for it. One is the chip that uh, Theodor Berger has been working on. Uh, his is, uh, is a hardware implementation of a little model of a small piece of neural circuitry. And in this case, the piece of circuitry he's trying to describe is in a pathway that's between the hippocampal area CA3 and CA1. Uh, those areas are involved in what we know as declarative memory or episodic memory. So to put it another way, if someone has damage here, if this piece of your brain doesn't work anymore, then you can remember everything that you've already learned, but you can't learn any new things. So every day seems like it's the first day, or you know, every day is kind of like experienced over again. Um, so, excuse me, can, can that chip just record what's happening there, and also can it uh, stimulate the system with the... Yes, yeah, I was going to go into that just now, actually. So the chip isn't very, isn't very complex. It's kind of just assuming that this is a black box and describing what kind of input is coming in, what is the output, and, well, how do we get the same correlation to happen again so that when you get a certain input, you get a certain output. It's trying to replace that piece of pathway. And it does that... Um, to a degree. It's only been tested in, in certain tasks. For example, rats that are carrying out what's called a delayed non-match to sample task. So when they see, um, they get a food reward when they press the lever that is the opposite of the one that they saw appearing the last trial. So they have to remember something and they have to remember the order and they have to carry out something in return. And that is exactly the sort of task that you need a hippocampus for because it stores episodic memory, so things that happened before, for a short period of time, until eventually they get offloaded to other parts of the brain, and that's why you don't need a hippocampus for old memories. And the chip can do that for that task. Uh, it has only a few inputs, actually. I think that the, the version that he uses most right now has only 16 uh, electrodes, 16 inputs, and something like eight outputs. Uh, he has some larger chips, too, but it seems to be sufficient for that simple task. Um, there are other caveats there. Uh, for example, the fact that this only works really well when you've been able to train the chip while this part of the system still worked, and then remove it, and then the chip can take over that function. <clears throat> it doesn't work as well when you take the chip that was trained for this piece in one rat and then move it into another rat, for example. So it's not, it's not easily exchangeable from one specimen to another. Um, but he has been working with that. He's been trying to see if you can do that kind of transfer, and apparently it is possible with training for the rats that receive a chip that was trained in another mouse. Or, sorry, was it a mouse or a rat? I think these were actually mice. I've been saying rats, but these were mice. And if it was then implanted in another mouse. How would you work out which input to map to which signal and which output to map to? 
corresponding signal if you're moving it from one rack to another? Yeah, you can't. Uh, it's, it's not that precise, so that's why it involves some training. It involves the mouse learning to work with the chip that is there. And it's kind of what you get with most neuroprostheses, even the ones that are not what we call a cognitive neuroprosthetic. That's a cognitive neuroprosthetic because it's deep in the brain. It doesn't connect directly to any of your senses. But even if you have a cochlear implant, for example, it involves several months of training to be able to work with that cochlear implant. So there's a lot of us getting used to the system rather than the system being perfectly designed to work with us. And that's actually part of the problem. That's part of what all the rest of this talk is about, which is how do you actually identify the systems in neural circuitry? How do you build the tools where you could get the kind of data at the kind of resolution you'd need to solve what you were asking? It's like, how do you really make it fit a specific piece of circuitry in one specific brain? OK, we're on to the next part, simplification. Now, you can imagine that if you're a black box and a system identification task is an entire brain, which is uh, what is assumed in, in many approaches that we could get into, but I won't, then you've got a really big problem because you have a system there with uh, 100 billion neurons and uh, trillions of synapses. So those are a lot of parameters. And you're trying to define what those parameters are uh, just by looking at some input and some output. Um, how much input, how much output, what could you, could you ever find out about it? Are you going to catch any of the latent function in there? That's really, really complicated. Um, so that's not generally how you go about this. Instead, you want to break down this really big system identification problem into a whole bunch of smaller system identification problems, each one of which are more tractable. And the smaller you make them, the more tractable they are. But you also need to understand how these smaller subsystems are interacting with one another. Otherwise, you're not gaining very much. So you need to know something about communication between those systems. So what you end up with is that you need to um, obtain this communication map. That's what we call connectomics. Uh, it's obtaining all the connections in a brain. It's a very popular field in neuroscience right now. And of course, you need to understand something about what all those pieces are. Now, one way of modeling even a neuron in terms of more smaller pieces, making them even simpler, is called a compartmental model. It's also the modeling method that is used uh, with the Blue Brain project, for example. Um, this means that you describe all of the dendrites and the axons here as little pieces of tubing. They're like cylinders. And each cylinder, because it has a certain radius, a certain size, it gives you information about what is the resistance and the capacitance in that little piece? So how does current travel in there? And you've got channel equations, the Hodgkin-Huxley equations that describe how you get input and output through these. So this allows you to take this entire tree of input, because there are synapses going into this neuron everywhere, and turn it into lots of little simple system identification problems. But of course, once you've done that, you need to still describe each one of those, meaning you need information about them. One type of information is exactly what I was just telling you, which is the morphology. So it tells you something about radius and size, and then you can deduct from that what are some of the parameters. Another would be to actually measure activity that's inside of these little pieces here. So we're going to get onto that in a moment. Uh, I don't know, should I mention these guys? They did some, uh, Briegman et al. and Bock et al. Uh, came up with some wonderful work in 2011. Both of them got into nature for it. They actually did a, a reconstruction of pieces of circuitry, namely from the retina and from the visual cortex, based on this sort of structural decomposition. And they matched that to functional recordings they'd done before, showing as a proof of principle that it's possible to create a, a circuit, a system from this structural data, and interpret it and know something about the system you were working with. So that was really awesome. And you should look at that if you're interested in this stuff. Okay, so. This is not really an aside. This is actually me finally explaining what I do, which is that because, as you can tell, this is a rather big problem, doing this kind of uh, circuit analysis, it involves a lot of different projects. It involves projects that work on tools to get the structure data. It involves projects that work on tools to get functional data. It involves projects that try to understand how to convert that into models, how to get functional models out of it. 
uh, testing hypotheses and building hardware. So all these different projects have to come together somewhere. And the main thing that I do is just to maintain a roadmap that keeps track of all of these problems, all of these possibilities. What kind of projects can solve this problem and that problem and that problem? Where is there a piece missing? Do we need to find someone who's doing that? Is there funding available for it? And just get it all together and keep everyone talking and make sure that they all have the same language so that all the pieces can work together. So that's the roadmap. <clears throat> OK. Tools for the structural decomposition. There are a number of different ways to go about this. Um, there is one that's been around for a while, and that's, of course, using something like an MRI to give you a geometric decomposition in terms of voxels, pieces of space in which you can say there's this much activity going on, or there's a difference of this much activity. Mostly, MRI gives you differences between a state and another state. Um, the problem with this is that the tools that provide that sort of data uh, don't do that at a very high resolution, neither temporally nor spatially. So we don't get a lot from this. Um, there are other uses for it, though. I'll get back to MRI a little bit later. Now, another one is that you know a lot about where the cell bodies are. So for example, let's say you take a piece of uh, a slice of neural tissue, or you take cultured neurons, and you can put them on an electrode grid. And the grid is, has a high enough resolution so that you have almost one electrode under each neuron. So you know where they are, and you can measure them all. When you can do that, then you can deduce from this a functional connectivity. So you've got a map of the functional connectivity rather than one that you've actually measured by looking at it. That works to a degree, but you can tell already that this is something where you might run into trouble if you're trying to do it in vivo, for instance. Uh, sorry, in vivo is the wrong word, in situ. Because in vivo, it is alive, but it's not in the, uh, in the animal. So the other method that is underway right now is Anthony Zador. He's got this wonderful idea of using RNA and DNA tags to extract the entire connectome, so how all neurons are connected to all other neurons in the brain. And what he does is he uses a virus to transport these little tags, which are all unique. They all have a slightly different code through neurons so that they pass one junction, one synapse from one neuron to the next. And they get connected to what's called the biotin tag there. That's a little piece that crosses the synapse. So that at that point, there is one tag, one DNA sequence that is different from all others that's there. And we know that it only occurs in one spot. But because the virus has put this into a cell, all of the connections that that cell makes to other cells carry that tag. So you can identify, OK, these are all places that were contacted by that neuron. Do this for all of the cells, and then just turn the brain into a big soup, pull all of the cells out, get, get all those tags from the cells so you can read which, cell, which tags are there, because tags always went across one synaptic boundary. So you receive tags from all of your neighbors. And what you have, basically, are pointers, bidirectional pointers that are pointing between each neuron, telling you, OK, this address, that address. So you've got connectivity between all the neurons. There are some issues with that as well. It doesn't tell you anything about the strength of a synapse. Um, it doesn't really deal with things like, uh, well, how big are the dendrites or the axons that these things are traveling through? So how does it affect the signal? So there's not really a lot of functional information there. But it gives you the basic connectome. Right. The final method is stacks of EM images. And this is actually where some of the best work's been done. So I was just mentioning these papers from 2011, Brigman et al. and Bok et al. They all worked with Winfried Denk, who has been taking blocks of neural tissue, uh, taking electron microscope images of them, ablating a piece of the surface, just something like 50 nanometers at a time, taking another image, 50 nanometers, taking another image, working his way down. And then you can reconstruct things like this and see that, for instance, here, this piece of axon here connects to that dendrite, and two neurons have a connection there, work your way all the way through the system. You have very detailed information. OK, so what kind of data do you get out of this? And I'm talking mostly about that last example, the one that has uh, Winfried Denk's stamp on it, and, and Hayworth, and uh, Lichtman, other people working with that method. Um, well, as I said before, you can then build something like a compartmental model, which has really small systems in it. Uh, and you can do that because you have this geometric data. 
The 3D shape also tells you a little bit about what type of a neuron you might be looking at, because they look different. So, for example, you can tell whether it's in the neuron. <laughs> Uh, a pyramidal cell or an interneuron. So you know whether it's an excitatory cell, something that, that makes other neurons fire more easily versus something that will inhibit firing. Uh, but it's still hard to tell exactly which type and classifying just based on morphology can be tricky. Uh, and another problem is that there are a lot of invisible parameters. So there's a lot that goes on inside a synapse here, for example, but telling exactly which types of channels are there and how they will respond when there's activity is not something you can necessarily get out of one of these uh, micrographs, these electron microscope images. Although there is work going on there. Um, Ed Boyden, for instance, is trying to work together with Ken Hayworth to build um, an electron microscope that will also have tags for, for proteins so that you can better identify which type of cell you're working with. So um, it's getting better, but there are definitely things missing. Now, the other part of it is uh, that you, when you have this structure and you've got this big compartmental model, you still don't have all of the parameters for what's going on there. You don't have all of the information you need to give you a functional model. The best way that you could do that is if you could actually record from each one of those in the living specimen. If you could find out reference points and you could record activity in there and see what is the shape of the signal and how does it respond. Now, um, this is a matter of resolution. The more reference points you have, the more information you can get about the system, the more you can make sure and verify that as you're tuning all the parameters, that it's reproducing faithfully what it's supposed to do. And of course, the duration of your measurements matters as well. If you measure for a longer period of time, you see more of what comes along, and you can better replicate how the system works. Now, tools to do this are not as far along as in the structural domain. Uh, there is some work to improve um, the recording electrodes that are traditionally used. So they're being used together with optogenetic selectivity now, so you can make sure that you're only activating certain groups of neurons, because optogenetics is being used to make sure that you can either activate or deactivate them selectively. Uh, that helps, because it makes a lot of the background go away when you're doing recordings. Um, it's, it's not me doing it, is it? I know, it's them. I, on this. it's them. Yeah. I need to learn more about the system so I can just shut them down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there is that. And then there's also a move towards making grids with way more electrodes. So one of the things being worked on at the MIT Media Lab, again in Boyden's lab, he's a wonderful tool builder. Um, they're trying to make grids that contain thousands of recording channels, up to 10,000 recording channels, plus optogenetics so that you can control what you're measuring from. Uh, but again, this is only goes so far because, I mean, how much of a pin cushion can you turn a brain into before it changes how that brain operates? So there's a certain limit there. Um, the other work that's really promising is working with uh, microscopic wireless probes or with um, um, what would you call it? It's like, um, I forget the word. I'll just go on. Anyway, microscopic wireless probes. I can't say too much about it because it so happens that this is actually a project that I'm involved with directly and that I've just been told that we're supposed to collect NDAs before going into a lot of details. So I won't go into any details right now. More interesting, let's go and talk about molecular ticker tapes, which is um, a, a collaboration between Northwestern University and again at Boyden's media lab and George Church's lab at Harvard. Uh, the idea there is a little bit similar to what I told you about Anthony Zador's method for collecting the information about the connectome. In this case, you're using DNA, or rather the amplification of DNA, so making a longer strand, as a way to record functional data. You stick one of these tapes inside a cell and you have a channel that is voltage, select, uh, voltage sensitive Whenever the voltage changes enough, so let's say if you have a spike, it changes how the amplification occurs. And in fact, it causes more or less errors. So you have errors in the replication of this DNA. This is a known DNA strand. It's an artificial DNA strand. And it's supposed to keep giving you the same sequence, A, T, 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 G, G, C, T, something like that. But you make mistakes. And the mistakes are directly correlated with the voltage. 
So you get a record here of what the voltage was that went by in the preceding time span. So then after you've done this, all you need to do again is get all of those tapes out and sequence them so that you can see what happened. That's no small undertaking when you're doing that for billions of DNA strands. But at least it's a method. Yes? Time. Oh, time. Okay. A few minutes. A few more minutes. Right. Well, it's a good thing we just got down to the difficulties, because that's the part I really wanted to rush through, I guess. <laughs> okay. So there are different kinds of difficulties with this. There are some that are general. They're about system identification in general. There are some that are particular to working with neurons and neural models, some that are unique to dealing with very large numbers of them. And then there's some that are really exclusive to the idea of how do you do the circuit reconstruction of an entire brain? How do you integrate all of these projects together? Um, so the first problem here is uh, the signals again. We were talking about just using spikes and just spikes from neurons. But you have to wonder, are there any other important contributions that we're missing? Uh, for example, we know that glial cells are all over the place in there, and they do have some influence on what's going on in neurons. Now, mostly we think they just modulate how the activity in neurons uh, uh, carries on, and it's rather a distributed activity, so it's not something quite as precise. Maybe, but we're not entirely sure. So there's something to look at there. Uh, then there's the issue of can neurons affect one another without even being directly connected? Is there the electric field, is that enough to do something? And actually, there has been some recent research by if I can pronounce that correctly, Anastasio et al, that, that showed that indeed weak electric fields can have an effect on how strongly or how readily a neuron fires or doesn't fire. And when you have many neurons around that are producing electric fields, that could have a cumulative effect. So this is something else to look into. Uh, of course, there's always the question, does it really matter? So if, for instance, these electric fields are just an epiphenomenon of the spiking that's going on anyway, are you capturing anything extra? Or is spiking still enough? So we might not have to look into it. Um, one of the big questions would be, well, are there any, is there any evidence of something about the mental functions that is still sustained when you get rid of, say, spiking? You can suppress spiking in cells or that is uh, no longer available when some of the other things that we're taking into account are taken out. So then you could think, OK, if there is still some evidence of that, then there are other factors to look at. OK, but right now we'll just assume that spikes are everything. Um, now, even if we do, and we're trying to predict spikes, uh, clearly, the more information we have, the better. So one of the problems here, one of the big difficulties, is trying to observe all that spiking. You want to be able to see what's going on in the original system so that you can learn from it and predict it. We talked about that a bit earlier. Extra information is always good, so if you know something about the voltage and where you are, it helps. Now, other difficulties. So I was talking about MRI earlier. It looks at large volumes. It's not very good for this parameter tuning problem. If you're trying to tune parameters in small neural circuits, being able to say that there's some activity in 1,000 or 100,000 cells may not be that helpful. But it can be helpful in validation. So if you have put a system together, it should be able to reproduce the same kind of distribution of activity and propagation of activity that you would see in an MRI. Of course, to do that, you need to be able to register spatially in your model where would you be. So it has to be a three-dimensional model so that you can get the same kind of results. If you're doing these reconstructions, the 3D reconstructions at 5 nanometer resolution that were done with electron microscopes, uh, there is the issue of classification. So you can carry out some general classification, parental versus interneuron, but there are other things that are missing. Um, you can break it down into departmental models, and you get some information from the radius about the resistance and the capacitance in these models that you're building that are basically elect electrical analogies of what's going on in a neuron. But how exactly the neuron really responds depends on the type of neuron, even when you have all this information about its resistance and capacitance. In the same way, there are also issues about the measurements you've taken. If you're doing this, there are a lot of things in there that change exactly which numbers you get out. So what is your radius going to be for one of those little pieces of dendrite, for example? It depends on exactly how good the focus was in some part of the image. And if the focus in a part of your electron microscope image is always slightly off in the top left corner, 
then you don't have a random error. You've got something that is systematic. Neural networks are very good at being robust when there are random errors to work around that. But if you've got a cumulative error, something that is always the same in some place systematically, that's not necessarily true. So these things matter. Those kinds of measurement problems matter. Another issue is that a snapshot, taking something like a bunch of slices, well, it is a snapshot. It means that you're only looking at one state of the brain, and it's not giving you a lot of information about how things change over time. But we know, for instance, that memory exists in many different stages. You've got early LTP, late LTP. I'm not going to go into all these details, obviously, but there are many different stages that depend on different mechanisms. And not all of this is visible. So getting a snapshot isn't enough to get you the dynamics. If we're working with the ticker tape data I was talking about just before, the molecular ticker tapes, then one of the things is that you need to stuff a number of those tapes into every neuron to get reliability because this amplification process isn't 100% reliable. So it's a statistical thing. Now, if you're doing that, if you're putting a lot of stuff in here, well, there's a the question of, does this interfere with the cell's mechanisms? Is it going to matter to how the cell operates? Are you changing the system while you're trying to observe it? You can get timestamps so that you can know that all your stuff is synchronized, and you can learn something about spikes and maybe even about the individual membrane potentials. But you do need to recover all the DNA. And the problem with that, if you're trying to get at all of these DNA snippets in those cells, is that after you've done that, you no longer have a slice available that you could put through electron microscope imaging. So if you want to get structure, you want to get all those dendrites and what's connected to what, and you also want to get the functional data, how are you going to combine those two tools? How are you going to do that? That's a problem. Officially out of time. Out of time. OK. Uh, can I just rush through the last yeah, bit, maybe? Yeah. OK, Okay. just quickly. So there's, there are other methods as well that we use, like optical um, fluorescent imaging. Uh, they also run into the problem that they disturb the system, because if you're going to do this for a lot, you need to put in view windows. You need to put in devices that actually go inside the brain where you can do this kind of fluorescent scope stuff. And that also becomes a big problem. Um, doing microscopic wireless devices deal with power and data volume issues, which means that you may not be able to sample continuously everywhere. You can only sample sporadically in some places. And then there's a question of when is that enough data? Uh, and that itself is actually a question. What, when do you have enough data? When do you have enough spike times, uh, electric field potentials, et cetera, to really produce something that's a reliable system? Uh, so, and should you do stimulations as well so that you can create combinations of activity and run it through its paces, basically, or should you just observe? Uh, and one thing I didn't even put on here, the entire system you're trying to record from is something that responds to activity. So if you're stimulating in order to run it through its paces, then you're also affecting the system. It probably changes as you're doing that observation. Well, one thing you can do to try to learn how to combine all these things, to combine structural data acquisition, how to combine functional data acquisition, and see where your algorithms go wrong before you even start working in a slice or in a culture, is you can start working in, a, in another model. So use a model to discover if your model developing algorithms are good. And just as one example, this is something I built a while ago. It's called NetMorph. It was something that describes how the growth cones of axons and dendrites develop and how they generate realistic cells, realistic networks. Uh, what you can do is build a system that you know exactly what the structure is and you know what the functions are that they're supposed to carry out, and then apply your structure extraction and your function extraction algorithms to it to see if you get the same thing. So it's, it's a good test, a first test. And then, of course, you should start small. So with little systems like C. elegans or the retina, which is what Brigman did, the hippocampal prosthetic that Berger has that we talked about before, or what Sebastian Sohn's trying to do now, which is uh, to extract memory from a piece of neural tissue. That's one of his newest projects, very interesting. And so just to summarize, um, well, a proof of concept is indeed something that you need to do because it gives you a real handle on what's going on. The only time you can actually find out what problems you need to deal with and how the, what the best solutions are if we are really working with it. So you need to work on it, some kind of small proof of concept. Um, so the, in terms of the tool, the problems that are there, I'd say the first big problem is making the tools that get the data. And the second one is how do you turn that data into a model? So that's the other big problem. Uh, system identification is obviously not a new problem. This is something that you do in every field of the exact sciences. So it's something where I hope 
that having presented this problem, and, and I will be presenting it a lot more in the future and writing about it, that people from other fields who have way more experience in this than neuroscientists do are going to come in and say, well, you could just do this because they're experts and they know that there are ways that you can approach certain problems in there. So I think this is really a good example for cross-disciplinary work. And then I just wanted to thank a few people, some of whom you've already heard multiple times in the presentation because they're involved a lot in this work. Thank you very much. Anyone wants to say for questions? Let's have some, maybe five, ten minutes, and before we clear the room, and as long as we're not being thrown out. Yep. Uh, can I ask a question about the DNA uh, picker tape method? Yeah. Sure. Uh, so you you inject something to the cells, and then that records the timing of a cell, and uh, that uh, the timing is uh, recorded on the DNA. Is yeah. that the, the idea? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you know what a ticker tape is? Something that you yeah, yeah. very old method kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. Exactly. Right? Um, so. What's the uh, temporal resolution of that method, and also what's the temporal size of the limitation of the data storage? Yeah, so uh, the temporal resolution is not bad, actually. The temporal resolution, if I remember correctly, is on the order of 100 hertz, which is approximately what you would need to capture what's going on in, in most neurons. But the size issue, um, I don't know. I mean, if this is... Yeah, I, this is something I can't really answer because I'm not enough of a biologist to really understand what kind of a volume DNA consumes when it's being uh, when it's being made and when it's it's kind of you know it wraps itself up. It sort of becomes this ball, this sort of twine that you've got there. I don't know how much volume that consumes and whether that's a problem for the cell. But I, you know, I do think indeed that at some at some point. You might be talking about something that interferes with so the function of the cell. This technology doesn't use the already existing DNA for yeah. this one, right? Yeah. You need to introduce something. Because you need to know what the sequence for our DNA is yeah. to amplify it and see where the errors are. Yeah. Any more questions? Actually, I have a question. How many people here are, are working on artificial intelligence in any way? Well, that's quite a few. So what's your take on something like this? Uh, anyway, you can ask a question first, of course. I have a question. Um, <clears throat> it seems to me that the potential for accumulating vast amounts of uninterpretable data is considerable. Any comment? Uh, my comment is, yes, you're right, of course. And um, that's why the first part of the talk was all about simplification and about keeping things simple. You don't want to look at too many signals at the same time. You just you want to keep everything separated. And the whole point of doing both the structure and the function recording is that ideally, you'll be looking at a small system, like say one neuron or less pieces of a neuron, and you have recording data about it. So within that localized bit of the structure, all you care about is the data that's relevant for that. And, and you have your functional data, and you've got your structural data, and you can describe what that piece of the system is. Yep. Still, it's a big problem because then when you put it all together, it's still so large that making sure that the entire system makes sense and that it's doing something that's, that, that is in any way correct is still a big problem. But yes, of course. That, we can't get around it, though, in the end, because in the end, we want to work with larger systems, systems big enough to actually demonstrate something interesting. And we know that in the brain, there are always thousands or millions of neurons involved in interesting functions and they're distributed in different parts of the brain. That's how it works. So eventually you have to address that. Yeah, so my question was really, um, you know, as a working in AI, where generally you try to abstract things a bit more, um, what's your take on this kind of challenge or this sort of this work? Does it seem that there's any connection with AI at all? or? Yeah, maybe I could make a comment. I, I'm only speaking for myself, but um, you know, given our background, I think we're it's computer science or engineers, or what you like, more likely to adopt that top-down approach where we build that system that recognizes a car. Then we go a bit deeper, like okay, these are the constraints of I don't know, at a certain level of biology. This is how we can model them. So this biological interpretation can give rise to our system, and then perhaps we can keep going down time until we get to spike time of plasticity, or even to tie down to the neuronal circuitry. But 
I think it's a little bit difficult for us to go from the other way up just because we don't have that, you know, I, I know that there are lots of different neurons and they do different things, but I don't really understand it. You know, a neuron for me is either on or off or sends a spike train, so that really hardcore biological insight is lacking. Yeah, I suspected as much because um, it seems to me that there has been about a hundred years worth of neuroscience work going on very much at the bottom level. Things like how do you identify a certain kind of neuron, how do you record from it, that sort of thing. And then there's been work going on very much at the top level. What kind of uh, visual perception uh, tasks can we carry out and what sort of errors do you see and stuff like that and then you learn something from it. But there's very little that goes on in that area between connecting those two. It's, uh, it's probably because the gap is so large. It's a big gap, I guess, yeah. So just a matter of clarification, what you call system identification sounds a lot like function discovery or it is. causal identification yes. in a different domain. There, there are a lot of words to describe basically the same process, and there are also a lot of different fields that do this under different terms. Yeah. I really think every exact science does it. Any other questions? Okay, well, let's take a speak again.